a nice big entrance on a grand and glorious Sunday such as this for All Saints Day. And what a wonderful thing it is for us to gather in the house of the Lord. Let us now attend to the presence of the holy and risen Christ as we seek to give all gratitude to him. Join me as we call ourselves to worship using these words from Psalm 77 that you'll find in the bulletin. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and will meditate on your mighty deeds. Thank you.
this series on remembrance, it's great to think about how every Sunday we're here, we have a chance to remember the fact that we are in need of God's grace, and that it's by that grace that we are saved. Even as we sing in this hymn, save us your people from consuming passions who by our own false hopes and aims are spent. We've got a focus on ourselves as a people, if we're honest, where our compassions don't always line up with the compassion of God, where our aims literally miss the mark, which is what they call sin. But the good news is that every time we go to God and say, God, forgive me, I need your help, he shows us mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And so with that knowledge, let us say our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Lord of all time and space, it is good for us to come before your throne and recount your majesty and goodness. It is good for us to come before your throne and remember how we are in dire need of your mercy. We have amnesia. How quickly we forget your providential care. We tremble before the unknown because we fail to remember your tender guidance and protection. We have misplaced the scrapbook of your engagement with us, and we can't recall where we placed it. We have foolishly deleted the memories of your awesome work in our lives, and our lives are devoid of joy of those encounters. Forgive us, Lord and impress upon us your great mercy so that we may never forget our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, hear and remember this good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for you. Christ rose for you. Christ reigns in power for you. And Christ prays for you. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. My friends, be at peace and know that you are forgiven. Testament lesson for today comes from Exodus chapter 16, verse 31 to 36. And this is uh, an interesting account of how the Lord is trying to help Israel remember what he is doing and has done for them as they were out in the desert. So let us listen now to the word of the Lord as it's recorded here in Exodus chapter 16, verse 31 through 36. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna. And keep it for the generation to come, so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to keep it for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna in front of the testimony that it might be kept. The Israelites ate manna 40 years. Until they came to the land that was settled, they ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. An omer is one-tenth of an ephah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
on this Sunday, we recognize those who have gone on before us. And in your bulletin, there is an insert that includes all those individuals that have been identified and those of us we seek to lift up and remember the influence that they've had upon us. At this time of the service, I'd just like to take a moment that we would be in prayer as not only do we remember these individuals and the positive impact that they've had upon us, but also those who may have gone on before us beyond just this past year, <clears throat> and even those that maybe we hadn't uh, submitted a name and uh, think about. Who are those people who have reflected the love of Jesus Christ, who have impacted us, whether a blood relation, good friend, or even a theological individual that has written pieces for us to consider? So let us now take a moment to be in prayer and to remember the value that these folks brought to us. Lord, with grief that weighs down upon our hearts as we reflect upon lives that <clears throat> have now left this earthly plane, but have joined in to the church triumphant, who are now nestled into your bosom, we pray that you would comfort our own hearts. We pray that you would continue to guide us as we seek to keep our eyes upon you, even as we realize that these individuals sought in their own way to try and honor you in their day. Lord, equip us to be those saints ourselves as we live into each day, as these individuals now make up the church triumphant and we continue to march on here as the church militant. Guide us in our words Direct us in our speech and in our actions. Help us to do that which is honorable in your sight, O Lord. For the treasure that we have or the experience, experiences that have been given to us and the relationships that have gone on before us to shape us for who we are. We give you thanks that we do not walk this world alone. But you, O oh Lord, lead us and you provide to us individuals that can take our hand and show us the way. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, on this day in which we remember. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, friends, the New Testament lesson comes to us from a very famous passage. <clears throat> it's actually the only account that gets into this kind of detail, which Luke, by his own admission, has said, I plan on giving a more detailed account of the life of Jesus. So if you were to read the synoptics, which Luke is part of the synoptics, but Matthew and Mark do not go into this great detail on this particular event that shapes us even today as a church. So if you'd like to follow along, you certainly may. This can be and we will attend to God's truth as captured here in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 23. Here now, God's word. And when the hour came, he, that is Jesus, reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. 
for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who is going to do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's do some praying, friends. Lord of mercy, God of hope, the one who shapes our lives, the one who equips us to do that which is honorable in your sight, the one who calls us into an intimate relationship with you. And even as we take this moment to remember, to sharpen our minds, to focus upon your truth, we pray your spirit would be at work even now to guide our thoughts, to soften our hearts, to question even of ourselves, is it I? Yet for us to realize it's by your grace that we have been saved. And so, Lord, as we encounter this, your holy word, we pray the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So yes, today we are launching a new series on remembering and remembrance. Wow. Seems appropriate because it is All Saints Day and we try to remember those who have gone on before us. And even more so, we're taking communion which is an act of remembrance. Seems kind of interesting for us as humans, right? We have this wonderful aspect of who we are that loves to be engaged in remembering. Now, the reality is, most of the time as we remember, we do so with a romantic, how shall I say, lenses that are tinted rose as we step into our reminiscence. Right? We think back on events and maybe soften the color a little bit right? <laughs> as we engage in our act of remembering. But I want us to look at the curio treasure that we have that really is at the nugget of what becomes remembering. That aspect that impacts us for today, how it is that that event shapes us in the present now. What is that aspect of who we are and our historical narrative that we have that goes beyond our family tree and taps into who we are as humans and what we have done? Hmm. Remembering. It's a good thing. And so we start this series, (laughs) and we, we recall immediately the words of Professor George Santayana. Some of you are familiar with this man, maybe not by name. He was a philosopher in Harvard in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And he's the one who coined the phrase, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Ah, yes. So, it's our attempt right now that we will not be those who are doomed (laughs) want <laughs> to step into a world of the value of remembering. And so here we go. We step into our text here in Luke 22. And what is it that we see? A very interesting thing comes right out of the page as Luke is recording this. Now remember, Luke was a friend of Paul's and Luke went on up as Paul was in Caesarea and probably commissioned by Paul. Why don't you go on up to Jerusalem and have a conversation with some of the disciples up there? I'm sure they'll give you some more color of what's going on. You might even have an opportunity to meet with Mary. And so Luke had that interaction with the disciples in Jerusalem. He's recording all of this. And one thing that I found as we're going into the text is a very unique grammatical feature. Now, on Friday, I was with the adult men's Bible study and Boy, we had fun looking at the grammatical feature of two participles that are beside, side by side and what that meant 
to our understanding and comprehension of the text of what John was saying. For us here, Luke is employing a very similar kind of grammatical trick for us to see. And it's very, very fascinating because when we draw our attention to this part of his text, right, in verse 15, he says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The thing that's fascinating is that when we read that, we're trying the best we can to capture an emotion. How do you capture emotion in written word? It's nearly impossible, right? But in the Greek, they have this really unique way of being able to do it because what Luke does is he takes a word, uses the noun form of it, and then uses the verb form of it and puts it right beside each other. And you may be sitting there thinking, what's that look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. The runner ran. Or in my instance, the cyclist cycled. Or for some of you, the teacher taught. If we're to look at this, as you look at that and say, well, of course a teacher teaches. Of course a cyclist cycles. But when you put those two together... It means that there is a huge amount of value here that they didn't just run. I mean, these guys put all their heart into it. That runner just ran. I mean, he was going for the gold. Now, from an emotional standpoint, for capturing what it is that Jesus is saying, the desirer had a desire. The desirer desired. Hmm. That would be the very wooden translation. What does that capture? What does that look like? It looks a piece like Jesus was fully engaged with this longing, this desire to be with his disciples. Was it because it was the Passover and all that that meant? Probably. Because Jesus was the one who helped architect the Passover through Moses. And now he's going to celebrate this Passover with every knowledge that he has, every bit of knowledge that this is his last Passover that he's going to celebrate with those disciples. Because he's about to initiate the second half, the fulfillment. And not only is Jesus remembering that which was what happened and what he had done, but now he's looking forward and providing for the disciples something that they will continue to be able to remember of what it is that Jesus has done and what God is doing. Imagine the emotional weight behind all of this. This is more than looking forward to having relatives come into your house for Thanksgiving. This is more than having that desire to hang out with a really close friend that you haven't seen in a long time. This is an emotional moment where Jesus is probably right on the cusp of of welling up in tears, which he does in the Garden of Gethsemane. He can't contain it anymore. This is the weight of emotion that's here on that day when Jesus comes in that upper room with his disciples and says, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this and longing for this. My heart is split open with compassion for you, knowing this is my last time and what is about to take place to me for the completion of the promise. Wow. You know, That's huge. That's absolutely huge. Do we realize that even as we come to this table? You know, we're called to remember. And so Jesus steps into this text of his, the normalcy of what the disciples would have known in the Passover this opportunity that it's so huge in the Hebrew identity, you know, when you think back of what are those events, who are those people that impact who you are today? Well, as a corporate body, 
the Passover is the top of the heap. Even to this day, at the end of the Passover celebration, what do they say? Next year, Jerusalem, right? Next year in Jerusalem, there's that sense of hope that, yes, we're going to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. This is their longing. Their huge identity is built around this whole event that took place of them being released out of captivity. And there's that jar of manna that was used to instruct the children. Do you see how God provided? Look, that's why we keep this jar. And there was this guy, his name was Moses, and he led us through. Oh, yeah, and there was this people group, the Egyptians, and oh, they treated us very poorly. Remember, remember all of this. And Jesus comes during the Passover, even as they're eating of the lamb shank and the bitter herbs and the sweet honey, all those components of the Passover. Jesus doesn't say, do this in remembrance of Moses or of the manna or even of the wickedness of the Egyptians. He just flips the script. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Hmm? I thought we were having the Passover. I thought we were remembering what God did and who we are today. Even as we set up a seat for Elijah. And isn't it true that all the, Eli all the prophets speak of remembrance? If you were to go through the minor and major prophets and even the Psalms, you'd see that remembering is a huge thing. Almost 115 times it's mentioned in some Bibles. Remember, remember. That's not even counting. Do not forget. This is a huge thing. But what is it that Jesus is doing now? Do this in remembrance of me. I can honestly tell you, he is not discounting the value and the impact of Moses and the prophets and those who've gone on before. But he is resetting the bearing, right? He is resetting the bearing of where our focus should be. Because it's too easy for us as humans to always look back with a sense of an idealized vision of the past. We do that. We nostalgically look back. That's exactly what the, what the Hebrews were doing the, as they were leaving Egypt, even as they confronted Moses. They said, oh, if we could go back to Egypt where we had the leeks and, and we had everything there. They were remembering it from a certain perspective, and it was only a few days out. Imagine you put a couple hundred years between it, and all of a sudden our remembrance gets a little more cloudy and we start to think of things as grand and glorious and nostalgia begins to take over and we live in nostalgia and we forget about that which is really of most importance because the past is the past. We need to recognize that first and foremost and we don't live in the past we learn from the past. But too often we get that mixed up and turned around backwards. And Jesus is setting the bearing again. Do this in remembrance of me. Set your focus here. Not on the manna. Not on Moses. Not on Egypt. Not on any of these other things. On me. That's the most important part here. And so what is it that we do as we engage in this act of remembrance and seeking to understand how it is that God is at work in us? Do we go ahead and just forget about the past and kick it out the door like some people want to do? Well, we can't have that knee-jerk reaction either and just say, hey, we're just going to plow ahead into the future as these innovative pioneers forgetting the past and moving on to the future. No, we can't do that. We look at Scripture once again, and we turn to Hebrews. And here in Hebrews chapter 11, we see a very good and inspirational part to what it is that we are to do. 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. What is it that chapter 11 does? It highlights all these great saints that have gone on. And then at the end, it says this. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. That's an interesting phrase. What's happening here is that Jesus is bringing it very clear to our comprehension that, yeah, keep your, your, your sight set on me because no matter how you look at the past and certain individuals or certain events that took place in the past and you have this more perfect view of who they are and you put them on a pedestal saying, wow, look how wonderful they are. No, Jesus is saying right here in, in verse uh, 39 and 40 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, they're not even perfect without you. The church comes together to work and recognizes the value of what God has done through those people, even as he's doing things through you. How is it that we're inspired by them and inspired by each other as we seek to honor the risen Lord Jesus Christ? That's how we remember. That's what we do. Augustine put it this way. He's the one who coined in the city of God. It's the church triumphant and the church militant that works together to reflect the love of God, to be able to engage in that which is true as one reflects that which is the fulfillment of the promise and the other reflects how it is we're going to get there, right? And so we work in, co in concert with one another, the church triumphant, the church militant, and yes, those terminology seems to be a little bit on the militaristic side. But let's think about what it is that we're really speaking of. The church in glory who has conquered over the effects of this broken world and taken into God's loving embrace. And those of us who know each day the fight that we fight to keep our focal point on Christ. The impact that sin has upon us. The reality of that. We are a militant church, not in militancy, but in recognizing that there is a fight before us, and we don't roll over and pretend that sin doesn't exist. We fight, and we're inspired by those who have gone on before us, and how they were able to endure, and what they did, and how they lived as they sought to trust Jesus Christ. You see, friends, as we engage in this act of remembering, we also recognize that it's here at the table that we are reminded that everything we do is in remembrance of what it is that God has done and doing in our lives. We step to this table, sure, remembering the saints who've gone on, we remember our sins that keep us from being able to do that which is honorable in God's sight. And more importantly, we remember our Savior who has claimed us and saved us by grace. Ultimately, we remember that it's God's provision that calls us into this identity of the church where God longs for us to be in communion with him, with a deep longing, a longing that can only be captured in feeble words of print, but can be experienced even as we take of this bread and drink of this cup. Do this in remembrance of him. Amen. Let us stand as we get to affirm and remember our faith using this classic Apostles' Creed. Let us recite these words together saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue our worship reflecting, spending some time remembering all of the blessings that God has given us, and then responding by giving back out of our time, our talent, and our treasure. We'll now receive this morning's offering. Thank you. 
gracious God, we thank you for all the ways as we've remembered that you've worked in our life. And God, we give now asking that you would use these gifts, that you would use us so that others would be able to have that same relationship with you where they might remember the grace and the love and the mercy you give them. We pray this in your name, O Christ. Amen. We begin to pull out the decorations, don't we? Put away the Halloween stuff. The summer's gone. Leaves have been packed up, most of them at least, maybe by this afternoon. And then the decorations for Christmas and Thanksgiving come out. All the invitations we want to write. The invitations that we'll receive. The invitations to come and celebrate. Celebrate a friendship. Celebrate our identity one with another. To remember what it is that we've gone through together as a family. To be able to remember our connection one to another. Ah, those are good things. And we look forward to them, even though it provides a little bit of anxious prior time. But there's an invitation that comes to us on this day. At the lead of this season, as we step in, and I believe is the more important invitation, the most important invitation, because it sets our bearing, keeps our eyes straight, where they need to be focused, so we're not falling off course. And so to be able to come on this particular day, on this particular Sunday, where we come to this particular table, we receive the most important invitation that requires a response, the RSVP, so to speak, an invitation that demands a response. What is our response to God's invitation to come to this table? even as you recognize I'm not worthy, even as you may recognize, I think I've given that person a cold shoulder over the year. Why are they extending me an invitation? Who am I to come to that party? Even as we judge ourselves and judge those around us, and maybe even judge God, that he hasn't answered my prayers the way I hoped he would. The invitation still stands. And he invites you to come to this table, his table, and enjoy a feast. It's not fenced off to anyone. And individuals will come from north and south and east and west, and they'll all gather around this table. And they'll recognize the wonder and splendor of God's love. Let us go to God in prayer. Loving Father God, on this day that we think of remembrance, and we also think of the saints that have gone on to glory, we remember the story that they helped teach us, whether it be the disciples or the generations that have followed that have continued to pass down the stories of how you, O oh God, have been working in your people's life. And so we remember that at creation, you created Adam and Eve in your image, and things were good as you walked in that garden. But we made a choice as people to do something we weren't supposed to. They ate of the fruit, but we realized that we also make choices. And God, you had a decision there. You could have just ended it right there. It's over. No longer. But no, God, you chose to remain faithful. And even though there was consequences, you went with them as they left the garden. They were still your people. And God, when they needed some more correction, you raised up prophets who had tried to speak to people about how they could live in God's way. And, and there's some correction and reform that happened, but... It still wasn't where it needed to be. But those same prophets spoke of a Messiah that would come. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you were that Messiah, that you chose to leave heaven and come down and be born as that babe in Bethlehem. 
to live among us so that we could see God in flesh. So that those people could have uh, remembrance after you died of how you lived and how you acted, one that they could pass on in the stories so that we can read those stories and get a, an image of what it's like. And God, we know that you earnestly desired to have this meal so that it could be a family meal that we passed on from generation to generation. And so God, as we take this ordinary bread and this juice, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be present with us, that as we break this bread and drink from the cup, we may remember your saving death, and that it might inspire us to go out and share that story with others. And so, God, help us to be your ambassadors. Help us to come alongside those that are grieving and be a presence that reminds them that you have not left them or forsaken them to be a presence that reminds them of the hope that we have in the resurrection. Help us come alongside those that have medical difficulties and be with them as they're waiting for answers or be with them as they're trying to care for someone, reminding them that you are the great physician. And God, we know that you have given us gifts and callings, and so God, as we're at our school or places of work or in our communities. God, help us to live in that call to be ones that are sharing the good news in all that we do so that more and more people would know who you are, that they would be given a chance to remember the relationship they have with you. And God, we even ask that you would be with the unspoken prayers of our hearts as we say the prayer that was passed down from generation to generation, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took that bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body. It is for you. Take and eat. And I think about that story that would have been told as captured in Exodus where God commissioned Moses and said, take some of that manna and put it in the jar. It tastes like coriander dipped in honey. Like, wow, that'd be really good. And even for us today, and remembering our Scottish heritage, we put this in our mouth and we go, oh, this is really good. But the goodness of that bread and what we remember, whether it be the manna or our Scottish shortbread, is nothing compared to the goodness of what Christ has done for us at this table of giving his body so we'd be forgiven and we would have life and we'd be filled with hope and to radiate that hope that tastes good to those who need it. So friends, take the body of Christ given to you. In a similar manner as they were around that table and as we say pretty much every month they were doing the Passover. They were remembering everything. Jesus wanted to put it in that new context. He wanted them to realize that, yes, God was faithful for all of those years, but God was going to continue to be faithful. 
And so he spoke of a new covenant at that table, which was going to be his blood shed for the forgiveness of their sins. And so as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord and Savior until he comes again. For these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. So as we get to the part of communion where we think about this cup and we realize what this cup represents, it's not easy to think about our sin. A lot of times we don't really want to do that. We'd like to forget the ways that we've done wrong. We'd like to forget what Christ had to go through because it's so painful to think about at times. But the reality is, as we drink this cup of salvation, we should do so with joy. Because we realize what Christ went through offers us true forgiveness. A chance to be forgiven for that laundry list of things where we've gone wrong. Because he was faithful and shed his blood for us. And so we drink of this cup now with joy. Let us join together in our prayer after communion. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. throwback into the 80s of Christian contemporary music. That's an awesome song. Oh, boy. We remember guys like Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant, don't we? But we remember more so what it is that Jesus did and what he's done to inspire even people such as that. And so go out, my friends, as an inspiration that others will say, I remember. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.